All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah, all black, <laughs> yo Welcome to Left to Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal We are joined today by Professor Tara T. Green the class distinguished professor and chair of African American studies at the University of Houston. She's the author of A Fatherless Child, Autobiographical Perspectives of African American Men, published by the University of Missouri Press, 2014. Also the author, See Me Naked, Black Women Defining Pleasure in the Interwar Era, published by Rutgers University Press, 2022. And she is joining us here today to talk about love activism and the respectable life of Alice Dunbar Nelson, which was published by Bloomsbury in 2022. Dana A. Williams writes of love activism and the respectable life of Alice Dunbar Nelson. The archival work Tara Green has done is remarkable. We now know more about Alice Dunbar Nelson than we imagined we could know. But there's more. The book teaches us about the layers of Black women's lives that go unremarked upon even when they are remarkable. The book about Alice Dunbar's life of activism is itself an act of liberation. How are you doing today, Professor Green? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, Thank you for joining us. Talk a little bit about your role to Alice Dunbar Nelson. Um, and as you mentioned uh, in in the opening of the book, it, it, you spent some time, <laughs> you know, trying to travel this road on this mm-hmm. figure. Yeah, well, it really starts at Dillard University, where I was an undergraduate student. I was an English major there. And I'm from the New Orleans area and was sort of surprised to hear when I got to Dillard that Black women had been writing who were from New Orleans. I don't understand why I didn't learn that in my Louisiana (laughs) history class or any literature class. So, um, you know, her work kind of stuck with me over the years. And of course, I would become a professor of literature, of African-American literature. And every now and again, I would touch on her in my classes, but, you know, I had these questions and that becomes the book. How much of the search, because in many ways, when, when authors write, when scholars write these kind of biographical pieces on figures, um, you know, it's a search for something, right? It's a search for somebody, it's a search for some essence that hasn't been captured, you know, in previous documentation of these figures. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much of this search for Alice Dunbar Nelson, you know, was motivated by the fact that, you know, there are folks who knew her, obviously, as an important activist and an important literary figure. But in some ways, we didn't know a whole lot about Alice Dunbar Nelson, other than the fact that she was at one time the wife of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that's the starting place for some people, and it kind of was the starting place for me. I did not know, you know, that we get these these biographies that short little biographies that are written in these collections, and we use those surveys to teach in our courses. And so she was the wife of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I wondered well, where did he come from? Because he wasn't from New Orleans, that I knew. And then I wondered, well, why did she even leave New Orleans? Because I thought that she had a somewhat privileged life. And so those were the questions that I had going into this. And it's really when she meets him that she begins to keep a documentation of her life. And that became uh, where I was able to really delve into and to find out more about her. Talk about this archival work. I mean, the, the thing that Professor Williams says that, you know, part of what the genius of this project is, is the archival work that you do, the archives that you unearth, you know, and and expand upon, you know, expouse upon, you know, for us to think about who Alice Dunbar Nelson was. So talk a little bit about your trip into the archives Um, what archives you were able to find, what kind of information, ephemera, if you will, that was there, 
that that folks really hadn't done enough with in the past. And, and he also mentioned how significant it was as you were doing this archival research, how significant the Black press was in terms of trying to capture some of the stories and the narratives of people that mainstream press for a long time, even still, you could argue, have paid very little attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Akasha Hall, thanks to her, I stand on her shoulders because she was the first to discover this, what we now think of as the archive, but it had been stuffed in, in this cottage, as she calls it, for um, Alice Dunbar Nelson's niece when she was living in Wilmington, Delaware, and then it, she would later sell it to the University of Delaware. So when I show up at the University of Delaware, I was just stunned that this material was there and that I, as a Black woman scholar, did not know that that work was there. It is very rare to find a large archive on Black women. So Mary Church Terrell is one of those who was clearly a pack rat. Some of her work is at Howard University, and um, a great bit of it is at the Library of Congress. And so that was actually one of the archives that I visited besides the archive at the University of Delaware. And then there's always, um, there was some work um, in Atlanta at the university's library there. But yeah, in order to sort of piece together the earlier parts of her life and then to go through 1935, it became really important to have access to this wonderful archive of black newspapers. At the time when I started 10 years before, that was not available mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. in the format in which it is now. We can just mm -hmm. go to the Library of Congress and and download and, and dive in to this wonderful archive. And because she was contributing as a journalist, um, I'm able also to see her on both sides. Sometimes she would write about herself and not give herself credit, which is interesting because she talked about herself in the third um, <laughs> in the third person. But um, but of course, there were people writing about her as well. She is a byproduct of a particularly historical moment in Black America, the emergence of the Black Women's Club movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you describe this book, the title of this book, The Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson. Talk about the Black Women's Club movement and, and this idea of what respectability looked like for Black women in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, um, and what role the, the Black Women's Club movement thought that being respectable as a Black woman would play in the larger goal of liberation for Black people. Yeah, it was all about the advancement of the race. And so Black Women's Club start actually pre-1865, and then they, they get together nationally around 1894, 1895. They have, um, I, I, sometimes I say to my students, uh, essence or ebony, but now they're, they're sort of like, well, what is that? But uh, <laughs> a Black newspaper by Black women for Black women. And that newspaper really, and, and some of those, those archives are online as well. And it's called The Women's Era for people who want to look that up. But that paper is really important because it, captures the voice of Black women at that particular time in the late 1800s. And what those women are doing, you know, I always tell students that we talk about Afrofuturism, they were future, yep. future forward thinkers. Yep. And so this is, let's plant these seeds now because this is what we can look like in the future. This is what we can achieve for a better future for ourselves. And so respectability comes out of that. It's a public performance. And Evelyn mm -hmm. um, Brooks mm -hmm. Hickenbotham mm -hmm. is really important in mm -hmm. articulating that for us by studying women of the time, but it's a public performance of, um, that is to be protective of the self, but also to say something of the self um, is self-defining in a Black feminist way. Alice Dunbar Nelson's sense of herself, particularly as a young person, this moment 
marred by the fact um, not only is she the byproduct of, of, of a biracial relationship, mm -hmm. um, but she's also the product of uh, a relationship that didn't lead to marriage, uh, you know, outside of marriage. And in many ways, you know, much of her early adult life, right, she carries the shame of, quote unquote, being illegitimate in that sense. And, and part of what drives her to the Black Women's Club movement, as you write, is in fact being involved with these respectable black women could convey a sense of respectability to her um but she did so she engaged in this or in these organizations uh, the phyllis wheatley club for example um she wrote you know both in terms of journalistic pieces but also in terms of of fiction and poetry you know addressing some of these ideas of, of black women's respectability but but she did so with critiques mm -hmm. um she was someone as you write in the book really is a kind of echo to the past of a bur burgeoning black feminist sensibility how did she not navigate what for her wasn't just about uplifting the race but better positioning black women in the world in a sense that in a way that we would read now as clearly being you know black feminists yeah, well, she uses every tool at her disposal. <laughs> the writing is one tool. And so, you know, the country, I think, is is more so, and I, I sort of debate with myself. So she was a journalist through the women's era and some other mm -hmm. pieces also, but also she was a fiction writer. And those two parts of her life were emerging really at the same time at a very young age. She's only around 20 years old. And in the fiction, she has the opportunity to critique uh, mm -hmm. how women are being treated, how women are being exploited, and how men are contributing to that, especially white men. So in some ways that could be biographical for her because it is my argument. And some people say, well, you don't, you know, we don't know, we don't have the DNA test and so on. But uh, <laughs> this is, is my argument that I make in the text. But also then she's writing the journal, the journalism, the editorials where she then is able to critique society and she's um but also uplifting black people and especially youth because she was an educator but also speaking out against um, the treatment of women and what black women can do to better position themselves in society so she's using all of those tools um, writing as well as being an educator and helping children and mothers to um, get the knowledge that they need to uplift the race, as they said. One of the things that I learned in reading your book, Professor Green, uh, was the extent that Alice Dunbar Nelson had an established writing career, a, a public persona, prior to her marriage mm -hmm. to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Um, and, and then how prolific she was after that marriage. I want to talk a little bit about the complications around their relationship. When people think of Alice Dunbar Nelson, um, it's always connected to Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who in many ways, in many, at least in some people's minds, it is a more well-known figure. But they're only married between 1897 and 1906. Um, they're separated from 1902 until his death in 1906 and a period of time between 97 when they first get married and, and 1902 um they're very rarely together talk about the complications of their relationship one that begins um when Dun dunbar reaches out to her because of her writing mm -hmm. right you know he he sees her as it, he sees that as the entry point i mean i think you write over and over how calculating and even manipulative Paul Lawrence Dunbar was in his attempts to woo Alice Dunbar Nelson. Um, but can you unpack a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the nature of their relationship, the difficulties of it, and, and the sexual violence that was a, a big part of that marriage, you know, as it went forward? You know, that relationship really in many ways defines her life, I think, because as I mentioned earlier, she begins to document her life pretty much when he 
sends her that first letter. And she intentionally keeps his name Dunbar because she understands mm-hmm. that being mm-hmm. connected to someone that was seen really as, you know, this, this, um, sometimes I, I try to help students by thinking about who is, is the man in, uh, <laughs> in popular <laughs> culture to understand, to help them to understand right. that Paul Lawrence Dunbar had this weight in society that wasn't just within black society at all i mean he was highly admired by uh, white people as well and so she marries this man after she has been sexually abused by him and you know it's it's just an abusive relationship and so she finally leaves him and it's not clear as to why But um, and even when he dies, she's not in conversation with him. So um, I think that later on, she kind of has some peace around the relationship, but uh, it takes her a while to get there. It takes her maybe two husbands later (laughs) because she's married three times. So it certainly doesn't (laughs) stop her from looking for the kind of love that she wants with a man. But that relationship was one that she continues to write about and continues to revisit and to think about um, Black men in particular. Something else that I want to add between them, I believe, is the issue of colorism. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. when Paul Lawrence reaches out to her and talks about her beauty and so on, and other scholars have written about this. Paul Lawrence Dunbar is this dark skinned man mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Alice Dunbar Nelson is a very light skinned woman who at times passes for white. Mm-hmm. And so there's sometimes an exchange between them where the N word is used, not at each other, but about other black people. Mm-hmm. And of course that becomes controversial for scholars, but really the fact that the two are together, there is critique of, why that attraction is there from the very beginning that I think that we should continue to think about and not ignore. And I mean, there's a way in which when you write about it and actually, you know, when you read some of, you know, Dunmar's references here, um, you know, he saw her as a prize, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of uh, idealized Black woman beauty, you know, you know, him working through his own, um, issues around his dark skin and, and being attracted to a light-skinned Black woman in that context. Uh, but you also talk about, you know, some of the complications in the context of their relationship, particularly around the rape that occurs before they get married, how on the one hand, um, because of this desire to be seen as a respectable Black woman, she can't admit that it was consensual because to do so would admit that she had sex before marriage. Um, And at the same time, you know, she can't openly discuss the fact that he sexually assaulted her, that he raped her. Uh, One, you know, because her mother and her sister were already already against the marriage, but also in terms of what that would do to his reputation when so much of her reputation was going to be tied to his reputation. Um, But yet you also write about the fact that he is in his own way still very supportive of her as a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a, it's complicated. It's really a truly complicated um, and and sad story because I believe that there is love and respect there. He really did support her as a writer. He did not support her as a woman working as a teacher, which she was very proud of some of her accomplishments in her career. But um, he shared Paul Reynolds, his agent. Of course, we see his name come up quite a bit when it comes to African-American literature. Mm -hmm. But um, she really learns about the publishing industry through her relationship with him and his sharing of how to write a novel, you know, commit to writing so many words, which she finds utterly... uh, (laughs) I mean, her, her writing of that, it's, it's like she has to take some sort of awful medicine every day 
<laughs> she did not. She clearly did not like writing in the longer forms. I think is it becomes clear very early in her career. <laughs> You mentioned she was married three times, which which is an oddity for any woman in this kind of early moments of post-Victorian life. Mm -hmm. um, but to be a Black woman who married three times, right? And, and the second husband, which she divorced. Um, talk about how she was perceived, you know, by other Black women in the Black women's club movement, you know, given her various marriages. Of course, Dunbar dies, uh, but she divorces her second husband um she at some time is involved with a younger man um and of course at the same time she's clearly also you know again a revelation to me in relationships um with women in this context how did she navigate all of this in the context of being someone who was so publicly aligned with the black women's club movement you know what i don't know that's the <laughs> fascinating thing to me <laughs> Why this woman, I mean, this could be why she was, um, she had these chronic illnesses as well, because she led a very um, busy and stressful life. <laughs> but the biggest controversy for her was not that she had relationships with women. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But it really was that she married this second man, not even that she divorced him. It was because he was younger. And yeah. that was the big thing for Black people at the time that they were clearly talking about in their letters. That was their internet. <laughs> you know, that was their what they were tweeting about and, and texting each other about. But that relationship with um, with Callis, author of Callis, um, as, as some people will hear that, know that that's an alpha jewel, right, that that right. Delta woman... <laughs> Right. Uh, was married. <laughs> was, well, one of the founders of yes, one of the right. founders, <laughs> and she's a, she becomes an early um, honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta. But that relationship was the one that really set folks a talking about Alice Dunbar Nelson. They didn't know about the women, and right. so when she gets out of that relationship. And she marries a third husband who is closer to age and, and um, you know, he has some standing. He's acceptable in some ways because he's a journalist and he's a widower. Then she is sort of back on the stage as a woman that people don't feel like they have to talk about her love life. What is to be said at all about... Um, how we should think about Alice Dunbar Nelson's output as a writer. Um, it, it's easy, of course, to think about all of these figures in the Harlem Renaissance as, as activists. Um, that's the way I think through history, they resonate most with us. Um, but how do we, and, and you, of course, as, as, as someone who's been trained in literature, um, how do we assess her work as an artist, particularly amongst her peers in that particular era? I admire her because she tried to write in every genre. Mm. And that was something that I did not go, know going into this. So I found out about the journalism early on, again, because of Akasha Hall's work. But I knew her, as I mentioned earlier, as a short fiction writer. I did not know that she had written the lyrics to the hymn for Delta Sigma Theta, even though I would carry that um, that <laughs> book and see her name there. <laughs> I never paid any attention to who actually wrote the lyrics. Um, the screenplay that she wrote, the plays, she loved, she loved drama. And drama was her entree into the screen world where she wanted to be um, involved with films. And so she tries to develop this relationship with the Oscar Michaud. So that is what, you know, her contributions. And of course, she was a poet also. And I, more work needs to be done, graduate students, scholars, more work really needs to be done on her work as a poet. But all of these areas were areas where she tried to master she at least tried and i love it i love that about her in this moment of of wokeness 
um, and I'm thinking about this in the most progressive sense of, of the phrase, and when so many young Black women are finding out about and embracing a, a kind of Black radical feminist perspective, how should our young folks, our students, think about the legacy of Alice Dunbar Nelson? Well, you know, they don't know about the Black Club Women's Movement. And mm -hmm. if I teach anything in a semester, I'm always proudest of the times in which I can keep sneaking in the Black Club Women's mm -hmm. because they really set a foundation. And, and um, Willie Coleman, who was a historian, and she wrote her dissertation actually on the Black Club Women's Movement, she was an activist in the 60s in California, and she realized at some point by the 70s that she thought that they were creating something new because she didn't know her history. Yeah. So these women, as, as one of my students has noted when I used to teach Black Lives Matter course, um, that they learn about early organizing from learning about these Black club women, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they were very clear mm -hmm. about having an agenda, <clears throat> about meeting, about um, what they were going to do locally, and then pooling their resources nationally, and that they had platforms. And so, um, and, then, and then that they wrote, and they came up with these ways to have these little fundraisers and these kinds of things. And so they really learn about organizing from these early Black women with their long dresses on and sometimes their <laughs> gloves and their hats. But these women were doing the thing in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Professor Green, what's next for you in the archive? Oh, wow. So... As you mentioned earlier in my book, uh, See Me Naked, there's a chapter there on the relationship between Yolanda and uh, W.E.B. Mm -hmm. So I want to do some more exploration of <laughs> not as much about that relationship, but really wanting to know more about Yolanda Du Bois. So that's one area. But I'm also doing some personal work. I think that it's important for us to kind of build archive. And so I'm thinking about my family and, and, and their lives and what was lost and what was gained growing up in North Louisiana. So um, I'm doing interviews in that area as well. Professor Tara T. Green is a class distinguished professor and chair of African-American studies at the University of Houston. She's the author of A Fartless Child, Autobiographical Perspectives of African-American Men, 2014, See Me Naked, Black Women Defining Pleasure in the Interwar Era, Rutgers 2022. And she joined us today to talk about love activism and the respectable life of Alice Dunbar Nelson, published by Bloomsbury in 2022. Thank you, Professor Green, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black.